Hey, what's up guys? It's Nicola from Calcunic, and today we're going to talk about integrating with partial fractions. Let's get right into it. So today we're going to discuss integrating with partial fractions, and we're going to see that there are actually three different types of methods to do this. We have type 1, type 2, and type 3 partial fraction decomposition. We're going to start with the simplest, type 1, and I'll explain in a bit what linear factors in multiplicity equals to 1 means, but let's just get started with an example and learn as we go. So let's say we're asked to find the integral of x plus 5 all over x cubed plus x squared minus 2x and of course dx and before we really get into it i just want to mention that we could only use a uh, partial fraction decomposition when the numerator here has a degree less than that of the denominator so the greatest power of x is strictly uh, less than the greatest power of x in the denominator. And so unfortunately for integration, we don't have a simple method to solve this. There's nothing like the quotient rule for derivatives. We have to be a little creative with our problem solving here. What we can think of is maybe we could somehow separate this expression here into smaller uh, fractions and then integrate them separately and hopefully have an easier way to do that. And so the idea here is to separate the denominator, x cubed plus x squared minus 2x, into its factors and then split them into separate fractions. So let's factor this. Uh, quickly to the side, we could pull out a term of x and we're left with x squared plus x minus 2. And this is equal to x times x minus 1 times x plus 2. And so we will have that this is equal to the integral of x plus 5 all over x times x minus 1 times x plus 2 dx. And let's just quickly get rid of the side work here. And now once we have factored this, we can see that we're going to use type 1 decomposition because each of the three factors in the denominator, uh, x, x minus one and x plus two, they're all linear. So the power on x is just one and they all have a multiplicity of one. What this means is that each factor is raised to the first power. We just omit it because it doesn't do anything. And so what we're gonna do now is take the interior of this expression without the integral and just work with it on the side and then try to separate it. And so what we're actually going to do is we're going to separate this particular expression into three smaller fractions, each of which will have a denominator being one of the factors of x times x minus 1 times x plus 2. And the numerator will be some constant that we have to find out. So this will be equal to a, that's just some constant a that we have to find, over x plus b over x minus 1, and then we'll call it plus c over x plus 2. And this is really the hardest part, at least in my opinion. We're very used to going from the right hand side to the left hand side, uh, and that is finding a common denominator and then grouping the fractions and making it into one fraction. But it's very rare that we want to go from left to right to then take our factored expression and then separate it back into the smaller expressions. However, we can notice that this process is very useful for finding integrals of such functions because on the right hand side, it is much easier to find the antiderivative of all the smaller expressions. So to find a, b, and c, first let's just multiply everything by the denominator on the left hand side. So we're gonna multiply everything by x times x minus one times x plus two. And let's see what we're left with. On the left hand side, x, goes with x, x minus one, x minus one, x plus two, x plus two. We're only left with x plus five. And this is equal to a times, well, the x's cancel out. We're left with times x minus one times x plus two. And then we have plus b, the x minus one cancels out, leaving us with x times uh, x plus two. And then finally plus c, the x plus two cancels out, leaving us with times x times x minus one. Now we have this relatively long expression 
And what some people might do is expand this all the way and then try to group like terms. But there's actually a really clever way to solve this problem much easier. We can notice that this expression has to hold for all values of x. So what we're going to do is input clever values for x that will make some of the constants a, b, and c uh, disappear or go away and leave us with much easier expressions. Uh, what do I mean by clever substitutions? Well, we can notice that if we plug in a value, um, let's say we plug in x is equal to 1. Well, we have this term here, x minus 1. 1 minus 1 will be 0. And then all of this will be 0 because 0 times anything is 0. And the same thing will happen over here because we have x minus 1. That becomes 0. So c times x times 0 will just be 0. And that will only leave us with the center term. A uh, very easy calculation to just find b. So let's try that. We have x equals 1. So the left-hand side will be equal to 1 plus 5, or 6. And this is equal to b times 1 times 1 plus 2 times 3. And once again, we're omitting the a and c terms because they're being multiplied by 0. Um, and so therefore, b is equal to 6 over 3. And that's just 2. So let's try another clever value. Uh, can you think of one? Well, we have this term x here for b and c. So let's plug in x equals 0, which will make those terms go away. And all we're going to be left with is 0 plus 5 on the left-hand side, or 5, which is equal to a times 0 minus 1, negative 1, times 0 plus 2, that's 2. Uh, we're going to have 5 is equal to negative 2a, and so therefore a is equal to negative 5 over 2. And our last uh, value for x we're going to substitute is going to be x equals minus 2. We see that the a and the b will go away, and that's just going to leave us with the c term. We have minus 2 plus 5, that's 3, is equal to c times minus 2 times minus 2 minus 1, that's minus 3. Uh, we have 3 is equal to minus 2 times minus 3, that's 6. The negatives cancel out, 6 times c. And then we have c is equal to 1 half. And so look at that. We have found our values for a, b, and c. So let's just write them out as to not forget them. a equals minus 5 over 2. b is equal to what? 2. And then c is equal to 1 half. Perfect. So let's just get rid of all the side work because we don't need it anymore. And now that we have found uh, what A, B, and C are, and let's go back to the question at hand. We can now write this integral as equal to minus 5 over 2 over x plus 2 over x minus 1 plus 1 over 2. That's going to be over x plus 2. And this is all with dx. And now using integration rules, we have that this is equal to the integral of minus 5 over 2 over x dx plus the integral of 2 over x minus 1 dx plus the integral of 1 over 2 over x plus 2 dx. And then what we're going to do here is just quickly take out the constants in the numerator because we don't need them. Negative 5 over 2 times the integral of 1 over x dx uh, plus 2 times the integral of 1 over x minus 1 dx, and then plus 1 over 2 times the integral of 1 over x plus 2 dx. Now to solve this, we're going to make use of a pretty common identity. If you don't have it memorized, don't worry, I have it written down here at the bottom. It says that the integral of 1 over ax plus b dx is equal to 1 over a times ln of the absolute value of x plus b plus some constant c because this is an indefinite integral. 
And this is easily verifiable if you take the integral, sorry, the derivative of the right hand side and you see you'll get just one over ax plus b. Um, now using this, we could write this as equal to, we have the constant out front, negative five over two, uh, times the integral of one over x dx, this becomes ln of the absolute value of x. Now we have plus uh, two times the integral of one over x minus one dx, that's going to be equal to ln of the absolute value of x minus one. Ln is just the natural logarithm, if you do not know. And then plus one over two times ln absolute value x plus two. And of course we add our constant c because this is in fact an indefinite integral. And there we have our first solution using type one partial fraction decomposition. So now we're moving on to type two decomposition. Slightly more complicated, but still not too bad. But we're gonna see one of the factors with a multiplicity greater than one. Let me show you what I mean by that. Let's say we're asked to find the integral of one over uh, x cubed minus two x squared plus x uh, dx, of course. And so let's go ahead and factor this. So we could use partial fractions. So we could pull out a x term from that, leaving us with x squared minus two x plus one. And this is equal to uh, x minus one squared, that right hand term. Um, so therefore, this is going to be equal to the integral of one over x times x minus one squared dx. And let's get rid of this spare information here we no longer need. And so this is exactly what I was referring to, the multiplicity greater than one. Here we have our term x minus one is raised to the power of two. So it's no longer uh, type one decomposition, we're calling this type two decomposition. Let's proceed as we did before. We'll take the inside of this and try to break it out into smaller fractions to make the integration simpler. So the way we wanna break this down is pretty similar to type one, but with a little extra to it. Uh, the first term, uh, a over x, straightforward as expected. However, with the x minus one term, we're gonna do something a little different. We're gonna say plus b over x minus one, then that's just x minus one, and then plus c over x minus one, and here we're gonna square it. We see here we're taking, we have x minus one squared, so we're gonna do b over x minus one and c over x minus one squared. We're basically taking all the lower powers and the power itself of that factor. If for example, we had to the power of three here, we would have another term here, call it plus d over x minus one cubed. And so we could continue solving as we have before. Let's clear out the denominators. We're gonna do this by multiplying everything by the denominator and the left-hand side, x times x minus one squared. So when we multiply it with that, we're left with one, obviously we have that cancel out, is equal to a uh, times x minus one squared plus b, that one x minus one term will cancel, uh, x times x minus one, and then plus c times x. Okay, so now we have this. Let's go about actually solving it. Uh, once again, we're gonna input some clever values for x. The first we can notice is when x is equal to one, because we'll have the a term here and the b term here go to zero, the x minus one to be in particular. Um, so we could ignore those. What we're left with is one is equal to C times one. That's pretty easy. C equals one, that's great. Um, the next one we could find is X equals zero, right? Because we have the X terms here. So B and C will go away, leaving us only with one is equal to A times negative one squared. One equals A negative one squared, that's just one and a equals one. Well, this is pretty easy. And so unfortunately we don't have any more clever uh, values for x because this polynomial only has two roots. However, we already have a, we have c, so we're just gonna input an arbitrary x uh, and conclude the calculations for b. So we're gonna pick a simple one, 
x equals negative 1 to make the calculations easier on ourselves. What we have is 1 equals a times negative 1 minus uh, 1, so negative 2 squared. We have plus b times negative 1 times minus 1 minus 1 minus 2, and then plus c times minus 1. And right now we're going to take the values we discovered before, a equals 1 and c equals 1, and input those we have. 1 is equal to 4 times a, which is 1, so just 4, uh, plus b times negative 1 times negative 2, that's just 2b. And then we have plus c minus 1, c is 1, so 1 times negative 1 minus 1. We have 1 equals 4 minus 1, uh, 3 plus 2b. Then moving 3 to the left hand side, we get negative 2 equals 2b, and so therefore b equals negative 1. Some very nice numbers here, and we could write them down uh, up top, a equals 1, b equals negative 1, c equals 1. So let's get rid of all of this extra information we no longer need, thankfully. Um, and this could go away too. So we could rewrite this integral finally as we have the integral of 1 over x plus or yeah plus negative 1 over x minus 1 plus 1 over x minus 1 squared of course the dx here and by using integration rules we could separate this into smaller integrals we're left with the integral of 1 over x dx uh, we're going to have minus the integral of 1 over x minus 1 dx and that's just by moving the constant negative 1 outside of the integral and finally plus uh, the integral of 1 over x minus 1 squared dx and from here on it's rather straightforward um, the first integral 1 over x that's just equal to ln of the absolute value of x we then have minus ln absolute value of x minus 1 that's also pretty straightforward this last one is a bit harder let's just use u substitution to solve it uh, we'll say u is equal to x minus 1 so du is equal to the integral of this sorry the derivative of this x minus 1 that's just 1 times dx so du equals dx that's pretty easy to see um, and now just on the side here, uh, this will become the integral of 1 over u squared. Uh, dx is du, so just du. And by using the power rule, we get that this is equal to negative 1 over u. And reverting the u substitution, we get negative 1 over x minus 1. And so that will be our final answer for that last integral. We're left with minus 1 over x minus 1 and of course plus c because this is an indefinite integral leaving us with our final answer so we're on to the last type of partial fraction decomposition type 3 and this is when one of at least one of the factors has a degree greater than 1 and the multiplicity is 1 so let's see an example that exhibits these properties so let's say we're asked to find the integral of 1 over x cubed plus x dx and this is pretty easy to factor out uh, we're left with the integral of 1 over x times x squared plus 1 dx and so we see here we have our one nonlinear factor x squared plus 1 uh, this factors degree is equal to 2 because of the x squared term and so therefore we have to use type 3 decomposition so let's see what this is actually going to turn out to equal so we have this and the start is similar to type 1 we have a over x but for the x squared plus 1 term we're not going to have b over that we're going to have bx plus c for some constant b and c over x squared plus 1 and basically what we're doing is we're putting the numerator 
as a polynomial that has a degree one less than the denominator. In this case, we have a degree of two, and so the numerator has a degree of one. If, if for example, we had x cubed plus one in the denominator, we would have uh, bx squared plus cx plus d in the numerator, a polynomial of degree two. But this is the case for our problem right now, so let's work with it. Let's uh, clear out the denominator by multiplying everything by x times x squared plus one, so we're left with 1 is equal to uh, the x cancel out, uh, a times x squared plus 1. And then plus we have bx plus c times what? Well, the x squared plus 1 to cancels out. We're left with times x. Um, so there's only one uh, real root of the initial polynomial. Uh, that's when x equals 0. So let's try that uh, substitution. We say x equals 0. In that case, we have this will all become zero. We're left with one equals a times x squared plus one or zero squared plus one. That's just one, a times one. So therefore a equals one, that's pretty straightforward. Um, and now since we have no more real roots of the polynomial, what we're gonna do is expand the equation here and then try some clever grouping and factorizing. So expanding, we're left with one equals. So first we have eight times x squared and eight times one. So what we have is ax squared plus a. And with the other one, we have bx times x and c times x. So we're left with plus uh, bx squared plus cx. And we see here we have two terms of x squared. So we could group them bring out the common factor of x squared, we're left with a plus b x squared plus cx plus 1. And so see here that we have a term of x squared and a term of x here, but there's no x on the left hand side of the equation. That must mean that the two coefficients of the terms with x must be both equal to 0. Otherwise, the equation wouldn't be uh, equated. It wouldn't be valid. So what we're going to have is a plus b equals 0, and also c equals 0. Uh, c equals 0, so that's done. And then we have a plus b equals 0. Recall that a equals 1. So therefore, 1 plus b equals 0. b equals negative 1. So let's write that up top. We have a equals 1, b equals negative 1 and c equals zero. Now we could clean up our spare work that we no longer need and finish writing this problem out. So now with the knowledge at hand, we know that the integral here is equivalent to one over x plus, we have negative one x plus zero, so minus x over x squared plus 1 dx. By using integration rules, we could get that this is equal to the integral of 1 over x dx, and then minus, taking out the constant negative 1 term, the integral of x over x squared plus 1 dx. And so now the first integral is straightforward to solve. We've already done this before. It's equal to ln the absolute value of x. And then we have minus this here. For this, we're going to need to use some u substitution. So let's get right into that. We're going to say u is equal to x squared plus 1. So taking the derivative of both sides, we get du is equal to, what is that? We have 2x times dx. And so therefore, by rearranging dx is equal to du over 2x. Perfect. So uh, continuing, using this information, we have the integral of, we'll keep the x over the denominator, which becomes just u, and dx is du over 2. So, oh, sorry, over 2x, can't forget that. So the x's will cancel out and if we bring the one half term out into the front, we get this equal to one half, the integral of one over u du. We know this equal to one over two times uh, ln the absolute value of u. And by re-inputting the initial substitution for u, we have this is equal to one half ln of x squared plus one. Uh, we could omit the 
absolute value because x squared plus one is always positive. So that's nice. And we know the answer now. So therefore the final answer, we have lot of absolute value of x minus one over two times ln of x squared plus one. And of course, plus c for some constant c. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you had any questions about the video or just other video suggestions, drop them down in the comments below. I do try to get to all of them. And if you made it this far, leave a thumbs up if you liked it and subscribe if you loved it. That's all from me. Till next time.